Hi, good morning and welcome to uh, this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. You can always um, catch our show and watch it from our archives at your convenience. <clears throat> Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So uh, please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think who might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Um, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, uh, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, basically just anything that libraries might be interested in. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in our state, and that is for all types of libraries. So you will find things on our show for all types of libraries, uh, public, K-12, academic, special, corrections, any sort of museums or archives um, are out there uh, that you can, um, you, sh you should be able to find something for somebody <laughs> for you on the show. Um, we have our archives here. I want to show you that first. Um, I mentioned that earlier. Our archives are here. Our upcoming shows are here and then our archives are right beneath. So if you do want to watch any of our previous shows, today's archive will be posted right here at the top of the list um, for everyone. But this is where you can access any of our previous shows. I just want to mention this while we're here. You can search our archives for a topic or, as, like I said, any sort of topic you might find, um, or limit your search to the most recent 12 months. Uh, this is because this is our full show archives for Encompass Live, and, and I'm not going to scroll all the way down because that would be a lot of scrolling. <laughs> but Encompass Live premiered in January 2009, so we've got over 10 years worth of recordings here. So um, it's a long list. Uh, so just do pay attention to the original broadcast date of anything if you are looking through our archives for something. Uh, many of the shows will stand the test of time. They'll, you know, everything will be correct and information will be useful. But some things will become ex um, outdated or um, things will change. Uh, services or product products or programs might not exist anymore. Links may be broken to websites that we talked about five, eight years ago. Um, so just pay attention to the original broadcast date if you are watching any of our archives. But we um, are librarians here, and so uh, as we do, we archive things and keep things for historical purposes. We will always have our, our full archives up here, um, as long as we have the uh, technical capabilities between us and YouTube to uh, be able to do that. Um, as I said, we do a mixture of things here on the show, and we um, sometimes have Nebraska Library Commission staff do presentations about things that we're doing here um, through the commission, and we sometimes bring in guest speakers. Um, and this morning, we have a mixture of that, actually. Uh, today, we are talking about Best New Children's Books of 2020, uh, New Kids, New um, Children's Books. This is a companion, I, I call it a companion presentation to our, which I'll actually show you, it's just here in the archives, to the Best New Teen Reads of 2020, which was done a couple of weeks ago. Sally Snyder, our coordinator of Children and Youth Services. Hi, Sally. Hi. <laughs> is here with us today. She did our Best New Teen Reads a couple of weeks ago. And then this morning, she is here with Dana Fontaine from our Fremont High School. Good morning, Dana. Good morning. Uh, to talk about uh, the children's books. And I am going to hand over presenter control to you now, Dana, so you can get your screen up. Awesome. There we go. All right. Can you see everything? And, yep. And if you do present, it should go full screen for us, I think. Yep. Here, let me just move this little control panel over. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. There we go. All right. I'm super pumped about the books I'm going to show you today. I'm super, super pumped. So let us begin. New books for the new year. Absolutely. So today we will be um, we will be exploring new children's literature in a variety of formats, ebooks. We even have manga on here. We have graphic novels. We have nonfiction. We have fiction. Just a whole bunch of things. But the first book that I'm going to talk about is probably one of my favorites. It's Queen of Tejano Music, Selena. And it's by Sylvia Lopez, illustrated by Paula, Paula Escobar. 
and it's so beautiful. It's also published in Spanish, and actually the Spanish version is selling a bit better than the English version, but this is still a really popular book. It focuses on all the positives of her life, and they kind of, they, they address her death and the tragedy of it, but it's very, um, it's very like kind of glossed over and they just say she died and it was sad. They don't go into anything, you know, too tra traumatic. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just a beautiful book and the writing is a little small, but the illustrations are just amazing. And the story is just great and it's uplifting and it shows how she overcome, overcame all this adversity and, you know, how millions just love her still, even to this day. And she's kind of making a resurgence in pop culture. Isn't there a new show or something coming out yeah, about her? Yeah, there's a mini series on Netflix. I knew there was something I'd seen somewhere. Yes, yeah. Hulu. I watched it and it was fantastic as well. So I, I might be a little bit biased. I'm a Selena fan. So <laughs> I, I really, I really like her. But this, like even I, I passed this book off to my colleagues and they really liked it. And I read it to my students and they liked it. So, I mean, it's a really popular one around here. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was Netflix for anyone who's Netflix. wondering. Who checked it. Yeah. Good. But I was like, I think it was Netflix. I'm not sure. But part one is on now, but they're coming out with a part two because um, part one ended with a mega cliffhanger. So. Ooh. I know, right? So, <laughs> and this, um, I suggest buying this book in both formats, both in English and Spanish, because you will definitely get a, t a ton more readers about this. All right, and then R E S P E C T, Aretha Frank Franklin, the Queen of Soul. There's a lot of trending books right now about about pop singers and you know famous people and people like people who are important in culture. And so, but they show a different aspect of their lives, which I really, really like. In this book, um, there's, you know, beautiful illustrations and it's diverse and it dives deep into her music, but it also tells about her civil rights activism. And um, she was an amazing performer, but she also stood up for what is right and what is um, what is important, and that's portrayed in this book. Um, I am every good thing. So, has anyone read the crown or crown? And it's about a haircut. This is by yeah. This is about the same author, or this is by like the same people who put this book together. And it's it's again, it's just beautiful, and it's diverse, and it's super uplifting. It is just. You know, some people just try to bring you down, but this this boy, he's like, I am, I am every good thing. And he's trying to find out kind of who he is. And it's just such a positive book. And it's written in verse, in poetry form, and it's just beautiful. I think and I'm a really big fan of of Crown, so I really like this one too. Um, for beautiful black boys who believe in a better world. I absolutely love this book. It's timely, it's diverse. It talks a lot about great vocabulary. It tells what like vigils are and it tells, you know, explains to kids what are happening in the world without talking down, talking down to them. You know, some books just kind of, you know, gloss over things and talk down to the kids. But this actually says like, it explains it what's happening in the world with race and everything. And it's completely unbiased. It's also about how some um, some police policemen were shot and killed. And it's about um, black boys who were, you know, taken from us. I mean, it's just a great timely read and it's simplistic without talking down to the reader. So, and it's, um, it's about this boy who wants his dreadlocks and his dad kind of goes into goes into dreadlocks and like cultural things, and it's just fantastic. Dana, it says yes. on the cover 2020 winner, but I can't read what it's the 2020 winner of. Do you know? Um, that Goddard you? Riverside CBC. I think it's a Youth Book Prize for Social Justice. Uh, 
So Thanks. maybe Canada Book. I don't know. I think CBC is Canada, right? Canada Book. Oh, yeah. Order. I'm not sure. I, I will look into that. I'll do a quick look on the uh, oh, please, please do novel list and see if it tells us that as an award. Yeah, yeah um, launched in 2017, the Goddard Riverside's uh, Stephen Russo Book Prize for Social Justice celebrates the power of the written word to create change in the name of justice for all people. I should okay. have known Crystal would get that right away. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Well, I, I'm just sitting here watching, so I can go and you know. I, know. I was wondering about that too, because you know it's a fairly new book. I'm like, oh, it, it already won something. So, um, cone cat. Speaking of cats, Krista, <laughs> cone cat. You must read this oh. book, <laughs> cone cat. Um, by, by Sarah Howden and um, Harmon Mock. It's so, so funny and it's adorable illustrations. It's a great read aloud and it's super relatable because I know we've all had pets that have done something to themselves that needed to, they needed to be in the cone of shame. And, you know, we try to make the cone pleasant, but the cat is super bemused. And he, he finds out that, oh, the cone isn't so bad. And then he does a bunch of things with the cone and decides, I like this cone. It's kind of my superpower. <laughs> and then it turns out he wakes up and there's no cone anymore. So he's he's conniving. He's kind of trying to get his way back into the cone, much to his owner's dismay. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I saw this is really cute. And then, Fuzz, okay, this is another one of my super favorites, Fuzzy Flamingo um, by Shelley Vaughn. And it's so, so, so funny. And it's, it has adorable illustrations. If you were a parent, I'm not, but I know some parents are just like, they won't eat anything. So Fuzzy, Fuzzy Flamingo will not eat shrimp. She refuses. And her name's Lola. And she refuses to eat shrimp. Her dad's like, eat shrimp, you'll become pink. And she's like, I don't want to eat shrimp at all. So she goes and she eats an avocado and she goes and eats various things that turn her feathers colors because she hates shrimp. They're, they're slimy. And it's a great read aloud. And there's a moral to the, to the story. And there's actually like helpful facts about flamingos. And it's just really, it's, it's really funny because I think parents can relate a lot to this. This one made me a little sad. Evelyn Del Rey is moving away. So Daniela wakes up one day and then um, her friend, is, her friend Evelyn is moving away. And they did everything together. They, you know, they were best friends and they were actually neighbors too. And so she's like, what am I gonna do? You're my best friend. And She's like, well, you can come visit, but it still won't be the same. And so Evelyn moves away, and then they, at the end, they go for a play date to the to Evelyn's new apartment. But but it, it, it's really kind of sad, and everyone has had like a friend that's moved away, and it's never the same because they're never like in your space, and it's so hard to keep in touch. And so that's what this book is about. And then this one, um, Eyes That Kiss in the Corners, just came out yesterday. So if you liked Hair Love, you will love this book. It's kind of a love story um, for Asian people who, for, for Asian people who have, who feel self-conscious about their eyes because mm -hmm. this little girl feels self-conscious about her eyes and she wants big blue or like big blue eyes with eyelashes and instead her eyes kiss in the corners and I love that description the what? way I love that description of me too me too cuz like how better to explain it mhm mm cuz i mean i just i just feel for this little girl cuz she's just like I can't change this, but like her mom and her grandma have the same eyes. And so she kind of feels a little bit better about how special her eyes are. And she's kind of wrestling with, you know, like I want to look the same as everyone else, but I think this little girl's beautiful. So 
-hmm. and it's super sweet. Oh, we do have a question actually oh, yeah. that I want to ask right now. Um, uh, someone wants to know what age group are the books um, uh, Cone Cat and, and Fussy Flamingo? What age group are we talking about here that they would be most appropriate for? I think School Library Journal, I think that said like preschool to second grade. And what was the other one? Uh, and Cone Cat and Fussy Flamingo. <clears throat> Cone Cat is like first to, I mean, I, it could be a little bit older, like third. First to third, like kindergarten to third. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So woke. This is actually a little bit older book. This is for like the the middle grade crowd a little bit. Um, a young poet's called Justice by Mahogany L. Brown, Elizabeth Acevedo. And if you if you read any young adult lit. She wrote, I am the Poetex, Clap When You Land, and With the Fire on High, and Olivia Getwood, illustrated by Theodore Taylor III. Um, there's great authors. It's diverse poetry. It's just, it's just a really good book about social justice. Mm -hmm. And she is in this, I mean, it's just about like, there, it's just a book of poetry. I, I I don't like to say just because this is a really powerful book. And so it's a great addition to your library or your classroom. And then this is my all time all time favorite book of 2020. Even though I do say that I know I say that a lot. <laughs> I say that a lot, but it's true. Like I feel passionate about every single one of these books on this list. On account you always are. It's awesome. <laughs> I'm laughing at the cover. <laughs> I know. Oh my god. Oh. At the end, the gum. Okay. I'm probably gonna spoil the ending, but at the end, the gum hops off and says, rude. Because she's like, I just, I just want this gum out of my hair. Because everybody actually wants, you know, everybody has a solution. Like her uncles and her aunts and the firefighters come in, and like there's so many people just trying to get this gosh darn gum out of her hair and we've all been there anybody with hair has had gum in it say, everyone can identify with this book children yeah. and adults alike <laughs> exactly <laughs> and bunny rabbits and cats there they are what even bunny rabbits and cats <laughs> i know <laughs> well, the cat will get the gum out of the hair well the cat gets stuck too so i mean it's just it's so funny. And then she, or, okay. So it's really a gender neutral. You don't really know what gender the, the kid is. Yeah. And he, and of course I love everything that Adam Rex writes, <laughs> but I mean, at the end, the gum is just like rude. And there's a twist at the end. There's picture day. It's picture day. <laughs> of course, of course it's picture day. <laughs> well, what age range would you call this one? Um, all of these are like preschool to grade two. Unless like we get to the graphic novels and those are a little older. Mm -hmm. but, but these picture books are great actually for all ages. I read these to high school kids sometimes and they just love them. Mm -hmm. So I think it's funny. And then my very first cookbook, this is super cute. It has, I, I have a lot of kids request cookbooks and they go home and they cook for their siblings or their parents. And it's super helpful. The very first page has like conversions on it. And so, when, and it even has a recipe for like laughter and it's easy re recipes. And it, um, it actually stresses like cook with your family please cook with your family and have a together activity so it's really it's a really cute book maybe very good right now when people are still you know yeah. um i don't not in lockdown but you know staying home a lot together and, and you know the parents are definitely having to cook more potentially and That's get the kids involved too and you have a book here that can help you guide them through that if you're not sure i know some parents are on top of you know are, are find it easier to teach their kids to cook and some are more, I don't even know where to begin with it. I, know, I think something exactly, like this can help a lot, yeah. Exactly, because they're the recipes are so simple mm -hmm. that, I mean, 
that anyone can do them, even me. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> much of, I'm not, I'm not very much of a cook. So I try really hard, but yeah, my mom never really taught me to cook. And so I've had to teach myself. So I was really impressed with this. You have to start somewhere and I would start with this one. So yeah, that's a good point because, you know, and it and it's in the and the ingredients are stuff you have on hand usually you don't need to go buy like capers in timbuktu you just need to go and like yeah you just need to go to hy V. so <laughs> sorry for those not living in nebraska hy V is like a local oh. grocery chain. <laughs> all right the couch potato the fourth installment of the bad seed the good egg and the cool bean so this is also very timely because it raises a good point like kids like with like no fault of their own they're sitting more they're sitting more they're on their technology more some classrooms are even virtual but then the couch potatoes um electricity goes out all the technology dies so he's like well, what am i gonna do so he looks outside and is like, hmm, I think I might actually go outside today. So so he he does that. And I didn't know this, but when researching this book after reading it, the term couch potato was coined in like the 70s or 80s about kids that sit too much. Huh. So I know I wasn't, I was, because I'm, I'm like, where did that even come from? So, mm -hmm. and it raises a good point. Sometimes we need to break from technology and this series is always super good. Okay, so there's a very cute story behind this book. Um, my very favorite book in the whole wide world. And it's illustrated, well, it's written by Malcolm Mitchell and he, he played football and he was actually a Super Bowl champ. So it's kind of a love story to reading. You can do so much with this book because this kid started off not liking reading at all. And this is a really important book. I personally, I think I'm going to read this at the beginning of the year next year um, to anybody that will have me in their classroom <laughs> because it's about finding the love of reading. So he goes to a bookstore and the book lady says, you should read all of these books, but they're kind of boring. And then he goes to the library and the librarian helps him, but he still doesn't find his favorite book. And then he says he took a stack of books to the swimming pool and to see if they could swim. And the librarian in me is like, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah please, please don't water water is the enemy <laughs> and so um yeah you can do so much with this book but by the end the ending is amazing the ending is he couldn't find his book his mom says you know why don't you just write a book or write a book that you want to read and he does he writes a book about himself and he reads it to his class and all of his classmates love it so it's it's it made my made my heart grow three sizes that day. <laughs> and then I I presented this on a previous presentation because I can't say enough about Ryan T. Higgins and the Penelope series. Penelope is back, and guess what? She plays guitar. And Penelope is at that dinosaur and but she has stage fright but she wants to show off her guitar playing skills to her classmates and so she, she at the end she goes and she plays guitar and she um, um she doesn't want her friends to think badly of her and she she kind of overcomes her stage fright so it's and she doesn't even eat any of her classmates this time. I was just going to ask that. <laughs> she, the first book was different. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think she's tempted. I think she's tempted with one one student, but I think she does ends up not eating him. So she does eat a lot of food, though. So in this one, <laughs> I was impressed with her plate. <laughs> 
Okay, so this is what Ollie saw, and this is actually translated from another language. I don't know what language it was in, but it was translated, but it's super cute. I like pigs, and so this cover kind of caught my eye, and I read it, and I obviously fell in love with it because it's a, it's about Ollie, and he sees things in a different way. So if he's in traffic, he thinks of it like as a circus, and he needs glasses, but he likes things the way they are. Like when he looks at things, he sees them different. And he has a great imagination, but he really, really doesn't want glasses. So, um, and it turns out he actually needs them pretty bad. So, and eventually he has to get them, but. All right, I Talk Like a River is also for the differently abled. Um, it's this, this main character has a stutter and he is super self-conscious about it. And so he takes a walk with his dad and his dad is like, you know, it's not that big of a deal. You know, the river burbles just like you do. And um, he's really insecure, but his dad explains how special he is and how it's okay not to speak super perfectly. And the illustrations are really, really pretty. And this is really great for parents too, because some parents are like, what do I do? Like, I want them to just overcome this. Well, this is also good advice for parents too, because the dad really makes a good connection with the, with the son. Oh, and then this is my favorite to talk about too, because it also has an app. It has a free app that you can download and all the all the proceeds, all the royalties. Dan Brown is not accepting the royalties. He's sending them to a charity. So um, Dan Brown, the same one that wrote the, a Da Vinci Code, he's actually quite a good musician. I was going to say, is that the damn Dan Brown we know? <laughs> yes, that's the Dan Brown we know and love. I don't know. I was so surprised when I got an alert, he was coming out with a picture book. I'm like, um, yes, I'm pre-ordering this. I have to read it. So um, all the illustrations are super cute, but also um, if you go and you read this book with the app, there is a song that you can, the, the words are in poetry, they're in verse, but if you read with the app, um, every page is a new song, and so there's instrumentals to go with each page. It says it's an augmented reality app, but it's not really an augmented reality app. It's basically just playing the songs while you are reading. So it's not bad though. I mean, that's I don't know. It's super cute. It's yeah. super cute because the even the first page when you turn to the first page um well there's a qr code but the first real page of the story um there's a maestro mouse and he's tapping his little music stand going tip tap tap and it's just really cute i don't know i was entertained i was entertained by that <laughs> all right so you want to be an owl so by jane porter um this book is nonfiction, kind of, but it it kind of like folds in the information to convince you to that that you want to become an owl or and it's an early reader and it disguises learning as entertainment. Um, it's super funny with great facts because it kind of just folds it in. It folds everything in. I mean, because it's like if you want to be an owl then your head has to turn 360 degrees or like just facts like that mm -hmm. and it shows diagrams and things and so it's learning disguise which is my very very favorite thing all right and one step further my story of math the moon and a lifelong mission so unfortunately katherine johnson just passed away not that long ago but this is that Katherine Johnson. She wrote this about herself and it's autobiographical and it's by National Geographic Kids and it's STEM and STEAM related. And it just tells how she came to build and help with the rocket. And she talks about the importance of math in her life and um, just how she used math 
to get to the moon. So it was super, it was super interesting. And of course, I'm a big Katherine Johnson fan. And if you've read the book, or if you've read the book or seen the movie Hidden Figures, Katherine mm -hmm. Johnson, or oh, Katherine Johnson's portrayed in that as well. And then class act, Sally and I had this both on our list because it can really fit, I think, in both. So um, this is actually a companion book to New Kid. It's not considered like a full sequel, but this is about his friend, uh, about Jordan's friend Drew. And he really, um, okay. So um, Drew was struggling with working hard because he feels like he has to prove himself and he feels he has to do better than the kids there because all the kids, he goes to a private school and he's in the minority. And he, he feels that he's working twice as hard as his classmates, but still not getting ahead. And he envies them. He envies his privileged classmates, but sometimes life on the outside looking in and actual living that privileged life is different because there are people he finds out that maybe have a different lifestyle than, than he assumes. And it's intrigue, and it's intriguing, just like the new kid, and it's a great author. You could probably finish this in one setting. It's really, it's really good. Sally, do you do you want to chime in on this, or do you want to wait to yours? I'll wait till I get to it on my list because oh. my notes are in the middle of the pages somewhere. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, okay. though. Yeah. yeah. And then twins. I really liked this book. Um, I really felt okay. So. It's diverse, it's a graphic novel, and it's super relatable. It's about twins, Francine and Maureen, except she doesn't go by Francine anymore. I really felt the hurt that Maureen felt when Fran was like, I wanna be different. I wanna have different class periods than you. I wanna be different. I want to be my own person. But Maureen was like, I still want my sister. I still want to be a twin. And she really, struggles with that and I feel I really feel for her in this because um you know she's like a built-in best friend but now Francine is growing up and actually doing different things and you know running with trying to run with a different friend group and not dressing alike anymore and so it's it's really hard on Marie and she's not adjusting well to, as, to middle school as much as Francine is. And so it's, I, re, I really like this one because I love twins, but it's just, it's, I feel really bad for Maureen because having a sister that you're like super close to and a friend just kind of go on their own path, it's kind of hard to watch. Next one the is- The thing about this is that uh, twins is that it's marked as a book one. So there, there's, expectations that it's a, going to be a series so this is book one from what i've read about it hopefully hopefully there's a sequel soon because i really liked it so okay and then snapdragon there's a little bit of lgbtq lgbtqia plus in here but not like it's not like super in your face and it's a graphic novel with eccentric characters and it has a little bit of magic in it so um, Snap needs a favor from Jax, and Jax is rumored to be a town witch. But Snap is skeptical that she can actually do anything. But once Snap starts to work with Jax, it becomes apparent that there's more to Jax than meets the eye. And there also may be a connection to Snap's family and Jack in the mix. And so Snap might be more special than she knows. And then PB and J stuck together and PB and J wannabes. PB and J stuck together is the first in the series. And then PB, PB and J is the second. And they're super cute. In fact, I think PB and I think PB and J stuck together is on Kindle Unlimited. So if you have that membership, you can read this for free. So PB and J wannabes and PB and J stuck together. It's hilarious. It's a graphic novel. It takes place on a farm, some of it. So there's eccentric characters and great storylines. So P is close to his family and he likes to roll around and 
<laughs> he likes to roll around on one time strawberries like I dare you. I dare you to run across the farm or roll across the farm. Well, then the thunderstorm starts and he gets lost. And then he meets B, who is who is appropriately named B. And then, and then he all, they also run into J, who is having trouble flying. And so they form this friendship. And it's just really silly, but really well written. And this is my all-time favorite as well. <laughs> yeah. So Bad Kitty Goes on Vacation, and it's beautiful. It's such a beautiful book. It's in full color now. So that's really exciting. And so when I got it, I was really, I didn't, I was not aware it'd be in full color. So I was really surprised. But this is probably, I think this is probably one of the funniest books in the Bad Kitty series because, he, because Uncle Murray takes Bad Kitty traveling on on an airplane they try to go on an airplane and he says the dreaded word cat carrier and bad kitty freaks out <laughs> like just freaks like starts shaking and stuff and the airplane the airplane guy is like why can't I say cat carrier and then uncle murray goes and says here he's in a cat carrier and uncle murray is shredded <laughs> so, and he has band-aids all over and anyway so bad kitty and uncle murray uncle murray goes and wins a radio competition to go to love love angel kitty world and it's as sparkly and pink and girly as you could possibly get and <laughs> Uncle Murray is not thrilled with this, but Bad Kitty is like, so we're going. <laughs> I'm not even going to discuss this with you. I'm going to go. So Bad Kitty has to, dress, <laughs> has to dress up like a human because they obviously won't let real cats into the world or into the Love, Love, Angel Kitty. So it is, it is so fun. I was like, I'm 34 years old and I was reading this and I was just like, ha, ha, ha. Like I was just <laughs> laughing about it i'm like this is so funny i love bad kitty and i love nick Roll. all right and then this is um i've never really added a manga to my list but this one actually fits with the age group and the fox and little tanuki it's cute it has talking animals it's in black and white so it's just a little simpler um it's actually a new series and it's kid friendly so um Please forgive me for mispronouncing these words. So, Senju, um, he's being punished for using his powers for evil and not good, and he had to wait 300 years to do these kind things to get back in the gods' good graces. So he tries to help Manpachi train to be an assistant to the gods. However, there's a catch. Every time Senju says something bad or has to does something bad, he wears this necklace that kind of gives him a shock or any kind of prohibits him from doing any horrible deeds and so it's it's really cute and funny and he really has to watch his actions and it teaches him to actually be be a good person or character i should say since he's not really a person and then this is an adorable series this is for like your girly girl readers that love animals and fluffy things and glitter and sparkles um cute talking animals it's a new series and it's all up but it has like meaning and morals to the story it um it's great for relaxing girl readers and um it's all about like loss and bullying her mom gets sick so she has to live with her uncle and um, she actually helps at his veterinary clinic. So I know like one of the top jobs that students want to be when they're little is a veterinarian. So it kind of goes through what it takes to be a veterinarian and all the sad things that you have to deal with. So, yep. All right. So that is, that is my presentation. All right. I'm going to make you a presenter now, Sally. Okay. For that little pop-up. And while we're getting slides, slides up, I'll, I'll let everybody know we will have, with the recording afterwards, we will have the slides that they both used and actual lists too. Um, as you saw Sally holding up her list, um, Sally, Dana, um, Dana, Sally had also sent me, you had a Word doc of yours as well. Um, so we will have, when we do do the um, recording, the archives, you guys have links to their lists and to their um, slides. Um, 
Dana, you can send me the link to your uh, Google slides so people can. I know some people like to see the list and some people like to see the um, book covers too. So, um, but we will have links to all of that um, when we do put the recording up. Okay. Oh, can you see my screen of Nebraska yep, Library Commission? the Library Commission website right now. Yep. Okay, because as anyone who's heard me talk before, I always do this first. If you want to get to my complete book list, the one attached to this uh, archived program will be the list of books I'm talking about today. But I have a complete list of all the picture books and everything else that I think go from 2020. And so that you can get if you go to our web page. And in the search box, you type handouts and see how it shows up down there. Then you go here, Nebraska Library Commission handouts. Mm -hmm. These are all my handouts. Anybody can put handouts here, but I'm the only one used, I'm had, I made them make this for me and I'm plopping all my handouts in here. So right now it says 2020 best children's books, complete list. So if you click on that, you get a PDF of all the books that I put on my list that I read and think you should think about these. So there's your option for that. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to show you where you can find that. Yep. So now I'm gonna to go to my presentation. Yep. Hopefully it'll all be magical. There you go. <laughs> yep, there you go, full screen, perfect. This used to say, originally I had, we were planning to do this for NLA's conference in October, but that got canceled, of course. So mm -hmm. it, before that it said so far, but now I'm just, uh, using my that I saw because I don't see every single book it just the Dana had a lot of books on her list that I haven't seen yet of course I'm going to be hounding our library to see how many I can get in my hands on just to read and enjoy it with you <laughs> I saw your list I'm like oh I should have had that one <laughs> <laughs> so this is um the ones that I'm going to talk about today and we might go a little long but bear with us because you can always come back and watch the rest of the presentation after it's archived if you have to leave it. Yep, yeah, that's another thing to mention. Yeah, for everyone who's anyone who <coughs> attention, officially we say our show is it goes from 10 to 11 a.m. Central Time. Um, but if we are on um, past 11, that's fine. Uh, we will keep going and keep recording um, as long as Sally has has books to talk about. And you guys are all, all welcome to you know stay along, stay on with us. But if you only did schedule just the one hour, that's fine. If you need to leave, you will have access to the full recording later, and you can watch and, and everything. And as people also you know, I, whoops, I have my blurbs written out on a piece of paper. I will read some of them, and others I'll talk about more, like Dana did, because. Um, some of them, like the first book, pronunciation is key. You'll see in a minute. Um, <laughs> Dana had a couple of uh, books that, because we had the same the same titles, and that's okay because I actually started off with a few early chapter books because I thought, well, I just want to mention these. And these do not overlap. So the first one, here's our pronunciation. This is told in full graphic, full color graphic novel format, and it is set in a small town in Nunavut, Canada. And School Library Journal says, this is a look at the world of Arctic First Nations, families, and legends. So um, siblings Kublu and Ketugu are going to the shore to meet Kublu's friend, Lisa. They encounter their grandfather on the way there. And he says, now be careful when you're at the shore. Don't stay around there too long because you might encounter a Kualupalik, which likes to hide under the ice and grab kill children. <laughs> so they're kind of going like, yeah. Well, the boy's a little bit worried because he's younger and the girls go, ah, he's just telling us stories, trying to scare us. There's no big deal. When they get to the shore, they see they see um, her friend Lisa's backpack, but they don't see Lisa. And now the boy's really worried because maybe she got grabbed. So they walk up to the rock and right behind the rock is Lisa. Oh, she was hiding to fool them. Okay, that's good. So now they're gonna walk back to the, the village. And as they're walking, Wait a minute, I'll try to pronounce it again. Patuquo, look, and his dog Lulu see a Kualupalik and they turn and they run as fast as they can. And they says, Ah, he's just crazy, and they never know what he's gonna do. It's a it's a graphic novel format, early chapter book, native, um, Arctic native people's legends and life, and uh, it's really was well, great fun. I think kids will just grab this. And oh, and there is a pronunciation guide in there. You saw oh, how well cool. I pronounced all those words, right? Uh, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> okay. 
The boy has a monster under his bed, but the monster loves him. When the boy's mom reads a story and then tells the boy, there's no such thing as monsters. The monster comes out after mom left, of course, to prove that he really does exist. As he's looking at the boy, he realizes the boy's getting ready to scream, so he swallows him. Well, that was the first thing he could think of to do to keep him from screaming and bothering the mom. Now he has to figure out how to get him back out again because he doesn't want to have the boy in his stomach. He just did that to keep things quiet. When the boy is finally coughed up, he is much smaller than he had been before. So now they have another problem. How do they get him back to his regular size before morning? And so um, the things I like about this are, oh, there are black and white and aqua illustrations inside the book. It's about friendship. The monster is really the boy's friend and problem solving. And also I like that monsters don't have to be scary. Infamous rat souls, I love these guys. I think this is book four. The big city scouts are going out on their first camping trip. Big Lou and Grandpa Ratso are in charge. Grandpa has the scouts oath just a tad wrong, saying that the scouts can fix any problem and do not need help. But on this trip, they need some help. <laughs> There are quirky characters that who at first seem like odd people out, but when everyone is in trouble, the whole crew pitches in and whatever is their quirky thing is the something that they really needed to help them get things resolved their, of their issues. So um, it's, it's again, another great Rat Souls book, all about the outdoors and working together and supporting each other, friendship and problem solving. And how, do you, how do you fix these issues we're having? I love the Rat Souls. <laughs> and Nate is great. This is a full color graphic novel. The men in beige are looking for the alien that crash landed in a snowy wooded area outside of town. Nate, the alien, runs into local boy Fossil just before the men in beige get there. Fossil helps Nate escape and then takes him home. Disguising Nate as a school friend, the two of them spend some time together at home and at school while Nate learns about what a lot more about Earth. He had come to get pizza for his home planet, but now he sees Earth has so much more to offer. It's about helping others, learning about a new place, and respecting Nate's culture and differences. That's all part of the story, and kids love aliens, as long as they're friendly. Well, Now I'm going to talk about fiction for grades, like two to five or so, rough, rough age group. <clears throat> This, oh no, that's not right. I got two pages. As soon as I looked at it, I knew that was the wrong page. Best friends Iris and Daniel, who are about 12, are both African-American and they accidentally discover a lost graveyard for African-Americans that was abandoned after the end of segregation. They make it their school project to learn more about the segregated cemeteries. But a girl, Avery, is buried there and she appears to Iris first in her dreams and later as a ghost. She wants to be remembered, and she wants to have Iris as her forever friend, which does not sound good. Over time, Avery becomes less friendly and more threatening, and Iris is in danger. There's class act. Yes, like we said, the, the part I wanted to talk about is it touches on microaggressions and inappropriate actions, because several people touch Drew's hair without asking or even if they ask and he says, no, they do it anyway, which is wrong. Nobody wants to be touched if they don't want to be touched. And then I did also particularly want to mention the, the um, incident when uh, Jordan's father is driving Jordan and Drew home, they are stopped by the police. Jordan's father gives them quick, no nonsense instructions. Phones down, nothing in your hands. Keep your hands where he can see them. Don't say a word. The officer is white and seems a bit puzzled by Mr. Banks asking if it is all right to open the glove compartment and also to reach into his pocket. The tension is obvious and the relief is strong when this turns out not to be a confrontation, just a simple traffic stop because of a, a car, the light was out. But the point is made so well of how the boys don't quite understand what the issue is at first and the father is very careful of how they handle this. And, and it's just a few pages. The whole book is wonderful, but I thought that was particularly well done. 
Oh, Piper is in seventh grade and she considers herself a blender. She'd rather blend in than stand out. But now her father has been hired as the music teacher at the exclusive Chumley Prep. She is thrust into a new school where it seems everyone excels. The quintessential bean girl is there at Ainsley and she is almost nonstop mean. Uh, while there, Piper finds some good friends and things are looking up and then a new competition is announced the Excelsior Prize. Everyone is determined to win it, even though nobody's really sure what the Excelsior Prize is honoring, but they're gonna win it. Piper manages to continue being herself, helping others and working hard in class. She also would like to win the new prize and the science fair is the first step. Piper is feeling good about her entry and then she is blindsided by Ainsley who uses a technicality to exclude Piper from the science fair, taking first place for herself and she hopes it will help Ainsley herself win the Excelsior Prize. I like how Piper can, she has some downtime or she's not feeling good, but mostly she's positive. She decides to stay herself and the, her friends are very supportive. Oh, this is a full color graphic novel. I love Wonder Woman. I read Wonder Woman when I was knee high to, you know. So it's great fun to encounter her again in several different versions recently. This conveys Diana's loneliness as the only child on the island and also her love and support for her Amazon family, her mother, aunts, and all on the island. When she's feeling particularly lonely, she makes a friend from clay and sand and she blows on it with a wish and it comes alive. Oh, she's so happy and excited. The trouble is her new friend, Mona, encourages Diana to get into trouble and to do some unkind things. Mona may not actually be her friend. It's about family, love, friendship, staying true to who you are, all included in this shorter graphic novel. This is wonderful. Oh my goodness. Nora is 12 and she and her family have just arrived in Florida from a refugee camp in Turkey, just as the president's 2017 Muslim ban was put in place. They had fled from Syria. Jordan is 12 and she and her family are ambassadors from their church to welcome the All One family and help them adjust to life in the U.S. Jordan and Nora become good friends. Nora loves birds and Jordan loves to compete in the swim meets for her school. But both of them have some issues they're, they're trying to deal with and overcome and they end up agreeing to help each other, support each other with their, their things they're working on. There is violence as someone set the local mosque on fire and Nora and her twin brother Amar encounter bullying at their new school. But they also encounter support from the the other worshipers at the mosque and other people who are very supportive of their arrival here in the U.S. So it's a a, a nice blending of um, immigration and why and because they were fleeing war and why they want to stay in the U.S. Here's twins again and I, I agree with Dana. I really felt for Maureen because she just at first she's blindsided by this it's the first day of school and suddenly francine fran is doing everything different and she didn't know this was coming and she didn't know they weren't going to be in the same classes and it's, it's really kind of harsh if you ask me but you do understand why fran wants to explore who she is by herself and she does feel bad she doesn't really want to abandon maureen but she feels more that she really has to find out who she is so I'm excited too that it's hopefully just the first book in a series. This is also a full color graphic novel. Jen is having trouble adjusting to her new life. Her mom married Walter and they moved from the city to a farm. Jen has chores, the worst one being taking care of the chickens, which I've never had to do, but I sure like to eat chicken. Anyway. <laughs> Walter has two daughters from a previous marriage and they come to spend time with, the, with their father every weekend. Andy appears to be perfect to Jen, the older um, daughter. Her younger sister, Reese, is also out of her comfort zone at the farm, so she relates more to Reese. Jen is having trouble with math, so the staffing, staffing the booth at the market puts too much pressure on her. She's supposed to be figuring this out in her head, what people are buying different things and what does that add up to? and it, it upsets her 
but everybody just tells her, oh, relax, it'll be fine, you'll be fine. Well, that is not helpful, but that's often how people react to that. It's fiction based on the author's life. So they, she's brought in some things that um, she felt and experienced when she was that age. This is a full color graphic novel, a fantasy. Lily is part of a family, not by blood, of thieves. And she is a novice thief. She kind of getting grumpy about the fact that she always gets the unimportant jobs like pickpocketing and such. She is determined to prove that she is just as good as anyone else at stealing things, even if she is a girl. Then one day she stumbles upon a secret group in their plot to resurrect an evil king. Can she and her mentor Seamus do anything to prevent it? There's daring do swordplay and lots of arrows. So lots of good action. <laughs> this is a full color graphic novel. Tai Pham is 13, he's Vietnamese American and he inherits his grandmother's jade ring and is shocked to find out her secret. She had been a member of the Green Lantern Corps and now Tai must learn how to wield the ring and protect others. There's dynamic art that really pulls the reader in he redesigns the uniform for comfort because that other outfit isn't so hot <laughs> and for workability. And I like the new uniform for him. Um, this is probably one of my favorite of the of the series that the DC Inc or whatever it's called is working on. This is a companion book to heat. This is the blurb I turned to for the other book. I, that's not right. It's not a companion book to heat. In this one, Nick Garcia is 12, and he is a star pitcher for his little league team, the Blazers. His hero is Michael Arroyo, who is now a pitcher for the Yankees. I think that's the main character in the first book, because I didn't read the first book. Nick and his older sister, Amelia, who has lupus, were born in the US, but their parents are here illegally from the Dominican Republic, having stayed after their visitor visas ran out. Now the family is fearful of immigration officers and they're just waiting until Amelia is 21 and she can sponsor their parents for citizenship at that point, but I think she's only 19 or early 20 at this point in the book. There's plenty of baseball action, friendship and heartfelt recognition of Nick's parents and their contributions to our society and the tough place they are in now. Victor, Nick's dad, acknowledges that he and his wife made some mistakes but they do hope to become citizens. So I think this is a, a good look at what people are, some people are going through while they try to live here, contribute and support their family. Mm -hmm. Zoe is celebrating her 12th birthday when she picks up the mail and finds a letter to her from her birth father who is in prison for a terrible crime. She hides it and reads it later. And it seems that her father had sent more letters that she has never seen. This is the first letter she's ever seen from him. Thus begins a correspondence and a couple of phone calls because she was helped by her grandma since her mother has forbidden her any contact with him. So she's going behind her mother's back and so it's grandma. He claims innocence, but Zoe knows he might be lying. She's not that naive to immediately believe him. However, she wants to look into the case. And she and her next door friend, Trevor, start a quest to find a lady who might be his alibi for this murder. Um, so it, it hits on injustices and racial profiling, family, friends, real friends that support you. And is she taking too big of a risk in what she's doing without telling her mom? Her mom finds out in the book and that gets worked out. But it's a wonderful um, mystery and um, look at how her father ended up in jail in the first place because he was innocent. I just got a hold of this book the other day. Whoops, I always turn my page too soon. In 1954, the federal government terminated the tribal status of several nations, one being the Umpqua, part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. In the book, this is fictionalized, but it's based on the author's experiences and life. Regina Pettit was 10 when this happened. Her father finds them a home in Los Angeles, education for him and a job via the 1957 Indian Relocation Program. It sounds great, but it was far from ideal. Racism and prejudice against Indians and against their new black neighbors is hard to face. 
And like I said, this is based on McManus's experiences as an Umqua, though she was only one year old when their nation was terminated. They did um, reinstate the, the status uh, in the 70s, I think it was. It's excellent, excellent historical fiction. Um, the co-author, Tracy Sorrell, completed the manuscript. She was asked to do that by Charlene because Charlene had cancer and passed away. Even though the co-author is of che the Cherokee Nation, she did a lot of checking with the Umqua and the people who could verify how, how she edited the book, I guess is the word. It's excellent historical fiction about something that very, I would guess very few kids know about that that ever happened. Ooh, you want something scary again? Look at that guy. Ooh. <laughs> Cowslip Grove is a neat and tidy town and everyone seems safe. Levi and Kat are the only people in town that realize children are disappearing. No one, not even their parents, remember the children once they are gone. It's like they never had these kids. Levi and Kat must save the children and the town before everyone disappears. So there's a scary bad guy, see the cover. There are scary, unusual animals, a mystery to be solved, of course, and there are black and white illustrations on every page. And that really draws readers in, sure, certainly drew me in, even the scary things. And I'm not good scary. with scary. Oh, the Sorry. scary ones are my, I love the scary ones. <laughs> well, see, I'm a real chicken, so I could read this book. So you know that if I can read it and, and enjoy it, it's scary level is, is lower than, because other scary stuff no Dana mm -hmm. you'll have to read those and talk about them <laughs> and that's something a lot of kids are into the scary books you know scaring themselves too the the books the movies the tv shows yeah that's true I'm a chicken my sister loves scary I can't take it <laughs> this is labeled as book one and it's set in London Omar and his family have just moved to a different house in London and he will begin attending a different school he is worried their new neighbor, Mrs. Rogers, talks to her grown son on the phone all the time, complaining about the Muslims. They turn the other cheek. In school, he meets Charlie, who tells him that the only student he should avoid is Daniel, a bully. Well, the next day, the class goes on a field trip to the Science Museum, and Daniel is his partner, of course. They get lost on the underground when they had to change trains. Daniel falls apart, and Omar keeps his head. They find their way to the London Central Mosque, because Omar knows where that is and how to get there, and that's when they find help. Omar is thoughtful and set on being friendly and helpful. By the story's end, Omar, Charlie, and Daniel are all friends, and Mrs. Rogers joins the family for their special meal on Eide. It's upbeat, positive, and informative, plenty of humor, and there are, as you can see on the cover, there's doodle-like art and lettering on every two-page spread. And the sequel, the second book, is Unexpected Super Spy. Omar and his family hear that their mosque needs to raise $30,000 in one month or it will have to close for safety reasons. Omar and his best friends, Charlie and Daniel, agree to raise all the money they can to contribute to this. They sell cookies, origami items, and old toys, but their best idea is a talent show. The principal approves and they end up raising $1,419.50. But the next morning, the envelope and money are gone from Omar's mom's purse. It was in there when they got home, he thinks. Who took it? Omar, Charlie, and Daniel work to solve the mystery. And again, there are good characters, a good mystery. And the solution is there that it's not really that obvious until you read to the end. Again, it's upbeat, positive, and again, plenty of humor and the, the drawings on all the pages. This is amazing. This, they call this a biographical novel of Muhammad Ali. It's told in free verse, that part's written by Kwame Alexander, with prose by James Patterson at each chapter's beginning. It's told from the viewpoint of Cassius Clay's best friend, Lucky, and the chapters are round one, round two, round three, up to 10, which is kind of fun. It's based on facts of his young life and his start in boxing, competing in the Golden Gloves tournaments, noting his drive and determination. It is an outstanding sports book biographical novel, and it includes occasional black and white illustrations. I think this will be flying off the shelves. And uh, you see a shirt where it says Cassius Clay, so they're making it clear that mm -hmm. that was his name at that time in his life. That's a great team up of authors for that, yeah. Yes, yes. 
it's this is book two of Max and the Midnights. I had to buy it. I want a copy. <laughs> well, there I am. My <laughs> school is pretty you, Sally. I bought a copy too. <laughs> Night school is pretty tough for Max, but she is determined to persevere. There is something odd happening happening in Bijovia, though, and it turns out to be there are copies of people that she knows, but the weird thing is they act the opposite of how they usually act. So someone who was friendly and happy is kind of grumpy and not friendly at all, and she knows, well, that's not like so-and-so. What's going on? Soon the Midnights are investigating the mystery. If there are graphic novel novel pages interspersed with text, and there are illustrations on every page, like the first book. I'm hoping there's going to be more and more and more in this series too. I gave them to my niece, great niece, for Christmas. I can't wait to hear what she had to say about those both books. It has a wonderful ending. Like, <gasps> yes, <laughs> that's all we'll say. <laughs> In the fictional land of Santa Maria, Max, 12, learns his father and grandfather have been helping refugees from, neighbor, from a neighboring country escape the war there and trouble on their way to a better place. This time, Max is the only one home, and while he knows it is against the law to help, he cannot abandon the girl at the door. When he realizes the path, path his grandfather took him on regularly for their walks and told him legends to help him remember the route, that path is the path for the refugees. So he leads the girl forward. This is the path his mother took many years before, and he hopes and wonders if he'll see her again. So this is about family, very supportive family, helping others, handling disappointment, and finding the good in others. It's a wonderful book. And it's a, a non-existent place, but they do have Spanish words in the book. So it gives the sense that you know it might be, because of course, Pat Mon Monroe, Monroe's Ryan. Okay, more full color graphic novels. I've been in the graphic novels lately. This is book one. Natalie or Nat is her, in, going to her first day of middle school and finds it confusing. Her former best friend, Lily, now mostly ignores her and spends all her time with Alex, a different girl who's very you know, popular and that's where Lily wants to be. On the positive side, she begins to realize that Zoe, who's been trying to help her, is actually a good friend. Nat was too obsessed with winning Lily back to see it at first. It's about adapting to middle school and accepting yourself, who you are, letting go of the negative. And she begins to embrace her artistic talents. I think readers of Real Friends by Shannon Hale or the graphic novels of Barry Brook Middle School by Svetlana Jamokova will likely grab this title too. And there's a, I don't have the, cover, but there's a second book so far called Forget Me Nat. Nat is smitten with Derek and he's all she can think about and she's beginning to ignore her friend Zoe and the uh, things she promised another friend she was going to do because it's all about Derek. He finally tells her that he just wants to be friends, so she is devastated. It's a good look at a crush and how it can affect a person, person's life and that friends need some of your time too and to remember that you are worthy, even if someone else does not value you. So I think those are good um, things to have in a book. Mom and dad divorce. This list, the list of things that will not change is their assurance to their daughter, B, who's 10, that they both will always love her. And she adds to this list throughout the book. The father is gay and eventually plans to marry his boyfriend, Jesse. B is looking forward to having a sister, Jesse's daughter, Sonia. She's ex so excited about this. When Sonia comes to visit a like a month before the wedding, she is not in the same place B is and does not really want to do much. But when she comes back for the wedding, things are better. B is learning about feelings and how they affect people. She visits a therapist who helps her with this and with her eczema, about some routines to do that will help her with her eczema. One thing she needed to learn that was that while others forgave her, she needed to forgive herself for something that had happened back um, in the summer. She knows families are complicated, feelings need to be acknowledged, acceptance of others as they are. There's a lot in this 216 page book. William Scoob Lamar is escaping his father's grounding due to getting in trouble at school. 
and he's traveling with grandma in her brand new Winnebago. Over time, he learns that she has several places she wants to visit or revisit in different states and Scoob has been conscripted as her accomplice. This is following civil rights history, why she and her then new husband wanted to visit certain places and why they ended up bypassing some for particular reasons. And now grandma's back. Grandma is a talented pickpocket and she continues to be willing to use her skills. So Scoob, is, who loves his grandma, tries to keep her on the straight and narrow and that is not easy. There are occasional black and white illustrations and this is an interesting story about, uh, about the history of the grandma's life and the civil rights movement and also how people end up where they end up. This is book one of a new series. Ryan Hart is in fourth grade, she's a girl and she knows Ryan means king. So her parents remind her to live up to her name. Her older brother's name is Ray. Her family recently had to move to a smaller, older house because her father had to take a different job that pays less, but they are making do. So this is really all about staying upbeat when life kind of hands you a, a, a tough thing and keeping positive and looking for the good while Ryan and Ray have occasional disagreements, the family supports each other as they settle into their new home and new neighborhood. And as I said, it's upbeat, seeing the best and doing your best. And I love Renee Watson's book, so another good one. And Jacqueline Woodson, oh my. This is told in free verse. ZJ's father is a professional football player. And he at one point, one time was a loving father who had played with ZJ and his friends and loved music and last, laughter and loved his family. That was before. Now his father is experiencing painful headaches and memory loss. It's set in the early 2000s when the study of the effects of many hits in football was just getting underway. Mm -hmm. The reality of the father's injuries is tough to see. Damage that has been done cannot be changed. And they have to see where they are and how they're gonna move forward. I have a few nonfiction titles. This is amazing, wonderful book. <laughs> Full color graphic memoir, Omar and his younger brother Hassan are Somali and have spent years in a refugee camp in Kenya ever since their father was killed and their mother told them to wait for her, but they couldn't wait, they had to run. They were fleeing from war and if they'd waited, they would have been killed too. Everyday life in the camp is told throughout the book there's boredom, frustration, and the hungry days. Food is giving out to each family group in two, for a two week period. The last few days of the two weeks, nobody in the camp has much food left. So they all are hungry until the next distribution. And this is just a natural part of their lives, something they face every two weeks. And it's heartbreaking just to know that much. They are, um, Omar is envious of those who are selected to leave and go and to another country to be uh, refugees sponsored by the United Nations or other groups. And even after several years in the camp, they still look for their mother every time new people arrive at the camp to see if maybe this time she's one of them. It's a 2021-2022 Golden Sower chapter book nominee. So yes. that's um, certain to I encourage you to get a copy for your library. And can you, since they put a sticker over the title, what is the title there? <laughs> oh, sorry. When stars are scattered. Stars are scattered. Okay. I have my own copy now, but I already had that scanned. So that sticker project uh, placement by the library. <laughs> <laughs> they put them where they always put them, I guess. Well, as we know, Steve Jenkins and Rob, Robin Page have done a number of books about different animals and animal groups. This one, the subtitle is The Strange Creatures That Live On Us, In Us, and Around Us. Ew. So <laughs> don't listen if you don't want to know more. Yeah. It's an, and so they, um, Steve Jenkins does an enlarged look at 24 creatures you may not want to know about. Some of them are only the size of a pinprick. So he's enlarged it like this cut, the one on this cover. So you can see how it's really put together. Mm -hmm. And he says in there, the, the images came from an electron microscope, which does not have color. So he invented the colors. So they may not be actual colors, but it um, is what he, he came up with. 
that this is what those animals really look like. So each page has a paragraph of information and a note telling the degree of enlargement to give the reader an idea of the creature's appendages, valves, pinchers, or other body parts. And then there is also an actual size silhouette or a pinpoint to let the reader know how small that creature really is. Wow. And um, it's fascinating. It's sure to be a hit with readers because, mm -hmm. you know, kids, they like to know about the thing that's living in your eyelashes. I don't know. I don't want to know about it. Anyway, <laughs> Yeah, but it is fascinating. And the last book on my list, this is a picture book biography of Benjamin Franklin. The author says it is based on his autobiography. So the things that he put in this book were things that Ben Franklin had mentioned in his autobiography. So it gives the reader a look at his childhood, his curiosity and determination to find a better way to do things because he was quite inventive. And that's just about his boyhood, not about how he later became one of the founding fathers. So thank you. That's, that's awesome. my list. Yay. All right. Awesome. All right. Uh, well, I should stop I sharing that up for now. Um, actually, um, actually, why don't I do this? I will. Yeah, leave that up for now. So um, thank you so much, uh, Dana and Sally. This is great. Um, we do this every year an annual uh, tradition, <laughs> I guess we'll call it. Um, and it's great to hear all the great, all the new books that have come out every year. Um, I get, I have um, two nieces, two nephews, and another one on the way. <laughs> so I'm always getting good ideas for books to get for the kids. Um, and of course, it's great for the libraries too. So um, thank you much for all of um, the, the great um, ideas. And, um, and we got some comments saying, thank you so much. This has been enlightening and you promoted great titles <laughs> uh, from the audience. So yeah, this is great. Um, I'm going to pull down, pull back presenter control to my screen and um, uh, talk about, let's see, get that up there. There we go. Yes, and wonderful titles and presentation. Yeah, good job every time. Um, as I said, we have been recording today and it will be posted onto our Encompass Live website here in our archive live shows. Archive Encompass Live, so it'll be the, at the top of the list here. Um, everyone who attended today and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's ready. Uh, probably sometime, yeah, by the end of the day tomorrow, everything will be processed and ready to go. And you'll get a message from me letting you know that it's here and ready to watch. We'll have the video um, on YouTube and there'll be links to um, both Sally and Dana's lists, just like uh, Word documents or PDFs, and to both of their slides if you want to see the um, book covers as well. Uh, Dana, you can just email me your link uh, to yeah. your Google Slides whenever you get a chance. Like I said, I'll be working on it uh, tomorrow and get everything up and ready. So it's plenty of time to get that up there. Will do. Um, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, I know people are coming in and out. This uh, today's show about children's book is a companion kind of to our best new teen reads of 2020, which Sally did a couple of weeks ago. So if you are a you know, youth, children's and teen librarian or you know, through the whole range of ages, uh, you can take a look at her teen reads, um, same kind of thing as today, the recording presentation slides and her handout of her notes and everything are on there. So if you want to catch up on the teen one and the children's one there together. Um, so uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending today. Uh, just a few more reminders. We do, uh, please do sign up for any of our upcoming shows. We've got our January dates here and our February ones starting to fill in here. Sign up for anything coming up. Uh, Encompass Live also does have a Facebook page. If you like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We also use the hashtag Encump Live, a little abbreviation for anything that we post on our other social media. Instagram, Twitter, etc. So do keep an eye on that out there as well. Um, so if you do like to use uh, Facebook, you can give us a like over there. Um, so that will wrap it for today's show. I just want to give one last reminder here at the Nebraska Library Commission. We do this weekly show, but we also do an annual online conference, a big talk from small libraries. It is held the last Friday in February every year, and it's coming up end of next month. But right now, our call for speakers is still open to um, through this Friday. It might be extended, depending. Um, so if you are in a small library, uh, you serve a population of 10,000 or less, this is a chance for you to share what you've been doing at your library. So if you are in a library in that situation, uh, send in a proposal. We're looking for all types of libraries. Um, public, academic, uh, school, 
and from all across the world, really, anybody who wants to. This is a this is not a Nebraska thing. This is a national conference. We have presenters. We've had presenters and speakers over the years from um, U.S., Canada, elsewhere, and it's um, we are co-sponsored by the Association for Rural and Small Libraries, ARSL, A-R-S-L. They they help us out with the conference as well. So uh, get your um, proposals into us and uh, join us for the tenth annual. This is going to be our tenth. Uh, big talk for small libraries. I'm very excited about that. <laughs> um, That's great. So yeah, if you are that type of library, get your proposal in or share it out um, to anywhere and everywhere you want to. Let people know if you know of a library that might be interested or might um, be the right type of library for this conference. Uh, please do share that. Other than that, thank you everyone very much, everyone, for attending this morning. Thanks, Dana and Sally. We'll see you again uh, next year <laughs> or next time. Um, we'll get you back in about a year to talk about whatever comes up in 2021, all the new books that will be published. Yes. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.